Assalamu alaikum and hello to my non-Muslim viewers. Today in this video I'm going to be talking about the evidence for Islam. Uh, so here we go. Now you might be saying um, the evidence for Islam, what evidence is there to support you know, the prophethood of Muhammad, peace be upon him, or what evidence is there that people should believe in the Quran and uh, stuff like that. What makes Islam, um, you know, the only religion that has evidence for itself? What makes Islam superior to the other religions, other religions like Judaism, Christianity, you know, uh, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, uh, atheism, agnosticism, uh, uh, you know, and uh, things like that, and other and various other religions, whether it's, you know, paganism, etc., etc. So what makes Islam, why should people believe in Islam to begin with, or why should people believe in the Prophet Muhammad or the Quran over, uh, you know, the Hindu Vedas scriptures or the, uh, or the New Testament or the Old Testament or the Jewish Talmud or, uh, you know, the Buddhist scriptures or any other, you know, religious uh, scripture or any other holy book or holy scripture. And the, uh, and, the, and the answer for that is because Islam is the only religion that has evidence for itself that can provide evidence for itself. Now, I'm not going to be uh, refuting arguments made uh, by Christian apologists and stuff like that. I, you can go to my other videos where I, where, where I interview, uh, you know, uh, scholars of, you know, people who have uh, credentials and scholars of, um, you know, the the Bible and stuff like that. Scholars like Richard Carey, like Dr. Richard Carey and Robert M. Price, I've already interviewed them about various aspects about Christianity and not not just Christianity, but the Old Testament and the New Testament and, and stuff like that. So I'll, that was already discussed in other videos. I, this video is only going to be, I'm only going to be discussing the evidence for Islam and why Islam is the only religion that has evidence for itself as opposed to other religions and other um, belief systems like, you know, uh, Hinduism, uh, why Islam has more evidence for itself like Hinduism, Jainism, uh, you know, atheism, agnosticism, etc., etc. So the first argument, uh, now, first of all, what are the some of the outdated arguments uh, for the evidence for Islam? Now, way back in the day, uh, you know, back in uh, I think the early 2000s or the late 2000s, and um, you know, back before those days, in the you know, Zakir Naik, Ahmad Didat days, um, you know, obviously Ahmad Didat's not, you know, he passed away, but now would be the Zakir Naik, you know, the the, the post Ahmad Didat days would be the Zakir Naik days. There would be an argument there that the proper moment, peace be upon him, is mentioned in the Bible or is mentioned in the Old Testament or is mentioned in the New Testament. Now I did some more research into that and if you read the tafsirs or if you read the commentaries of the Quran, uh, tafsirs like Tafsir ibn Kathir, Tafsir ibn Abbas, Tafsir al-Qurtubi, Tafsir al-Sabakshari, uh, you know, Tafsir, uh, you know, these, these other Tafsir Jaladin, etc. If you read these commentaries, it, it's clearly, it, the, commentar the commentators are clearly stating that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is predicted in the original Torah that was revealed to the old to the to Moses. So the original Torah, which was revealed to Moses, is not the Old Testament that we have today. That's an important distinction to be made. Is that the, it was a Torah revealed to Moses, not written about Moses. So even the most conservative Jewish or Christian scholars would say, yeah, the, the Torah came after Moses. Uh, for example, they'll say Joshua wrote Moses' death and stuff like that. So even the most conservative Christian or Jewish scholars would say, yeah, the Torah or the old, the five, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Exodus, Deuteronomy, and so those books came. Uh, you know, those books were like edited after Moses. So they'll at least admit that, even conservative Jewish or Christian apologists. Now, I have, um, there's this really good thing called the NIV Study Bible. And then these aren't, you know, atheists or anti supernatural liberals or whatever, you know, um, who have written or edited this book. And in this book, in this NIV Study Bible, uh, it says uh, that the authorship of you know, the the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Old Testament are anonymous. We don't know who wrote them. Uh, it's commonly said, yeah, Moses wrote Genesis, Deuteronomy, Numbers, etc. But according to, you know, these biblical scholars who are conservative Jewish and Christian scholars who are not atheists or agnostic or anti supernatural liberals or even Muslims, uh, these were added, these. You know, this Bible, the NIV Bible and stuff like that, was um, edited by, you know, uh, uh, 
was edited by uh, conservative Jewish and Christian scholars. They say the authorship of Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers is unknown. We don't know who wrote the books of the first five books of the Old Testament, or you know, the books of Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy uh, Exodus, etc., uh, Leviticus, etc. So later on. Uh, you know, Jew, Jewish scribes said, yeah, Moses wrote it, but in reality, the authorship of these five books is unknown. So there's no way, according to conservative Jewish and Christian scholars uh, from the NIV Bible, which is no, you know, anti-supernatural liberal Bible, they even they say that we don't know who wrote the, um, the first five books of the Old Testament. So uh, when Muslims say Prophet Muhammad is predicted in the Torah, it's a it was predicted in the Torah that was revealed to Moses. Maybe Moses wrote down his own Torah, or maybe Moses communicated, uh, you know, some kind of oral message of the Torah. But uh, like, it's a Torah. The problem moment is in the Torah, and the Torah revealed to Moses, not in the Old Testament. So you know, that's that's what I realized as I read the commentaries of Tafsir and Kathir, Tafsir and Baz, uh, Tafsir al Zamachri, Tafsir al Qurtubi, etc., etc. On the theory, so according to according to uh, according to the commentators of the Sir and the and the Abbas, etc., uh, Prophet Muhammad is predicted in the original Torah, but that original Torah is not the Old Testament. Same thing with the Injil. Prophet Muhammad was predicted in the Injil or the Gospel of Jesus, and the New Testament is not the Gospel of Jesus because even conservative. Uh, Christian apologists would say, yeah, the New Testament was written after Jesus. It, the, the New Testament just didn't fall out of the sky. It came and people wrote down the New Testament. So, um, so, uh, so according to the Tafsir Ibn Abbas or Tafsir Ibn Kathir, etc., etc., it was a gospel. There was a gospel revealed to Jesus, and Jesus predicted that a man named Ahmad or a man named Muhammad would come. But those words aren't in the in the New Testament because the New Testament is not the gospel of Jesus. The New Testament is the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospel of Paul. Uh, you know, the gospel of whoever wrote the pastoral. Um, Epistles, whoever wrote, whoever really wrote one Peter, two Peter, even conservative scholars say, yeah, two Peter could not have possibly came from Peter. Uh, whoever wrote the book of it, so that's the New Testament of the authors. That those those unknown authorship, those unknown uh, um, authors wrote down, you know, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But those gospel is not those gospels plural. It's not the gospel of Jesus. We don't have the gospel of Jesus anymore. Uh, maybe Jesus really said some kind of oral message, or maybe Jesus wrote down, who, like who knows. But uh, that gospel of Jesus we don't have today. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, isn't in the New Testament, or isn't in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, because according to according to Ibn Abbas, according to um, you know Ibn Kathir, etc. Prophet Muhammad was predicted in the Torah that was revealed to Moses in the New Testament, or the Gospel that was revealed to Jesus. And that Gospel is not the New Testament. That Torah is not the Old Testament that we have today. It was a revealed document to. It was a revealed revelation to Moses, and it was a revealed revelation to Jesus. So we don't have those revelations today, because Moses and Jesus aren't around today. So who knows what the original Torah and what the original Gospel actually said? So according to Muslim belief. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was predicted in the Gospel of Jesus, not the New Testament. According to Muslim belief, uh, Prophet Muhammad is prophesied in the Torah revealed to Moses, not the Old Testament. So that's 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 the first um, outdated argument. So that's why I don't use that argument anymore that the Prophet Muhammad is predicted in the in the Bible, uh, because you know usually those mess those debates or those arguments are messy and they're kind of incoherent so I don't I don't I personally don't use that um, that argument another outdated argument would be uh, you know the mathematical mir miracles of the Quran the, the mathematical miracle of the number 19 and uh, stuff like that now that's way or there's mathematical pattern in the Quran and stuff like that that's way too complicated to um, prove. Uh, you know, I'm not saying this, it's been disproven or anything like that. It's just, you know, from what I understood in my research, there's no evidence to support this 
uh, there's not much evidence to support it. I'll just put it that way. So a lot of this, these uh, mathematical miracles in the Quran, uh, you know, they're kind of too complicated to prove. I'll just put it that way. So you know, I personally don't use those mathematical. The math, there's a mathematical pattern in the Quran, or you know, the prophet what is prophesied in the Old Testament or the New Testament. I don't use those arguments because those are way too complicated arguments and Muslims don't have to prove that yeah there's a there's mathematical miracles in the Quran or proper moments in the Old and New Testament because nowhere in the Quran or nowhere does proper moments say yeah I'm predicted in the Bible or nowhere does it say yeah um, uh, or the Bible that we have today or the, the proper moment doesn't say I'm predicting the Old and New Testament and nowhere does the Quran say yeah there's mathematical proofs in here no it, they're, you know, so these are kind of outdated arguments. These are arguments Muslims shouldn't really use because it's too complicated to begin with. Um, so I don't, I personally advise Muslims not to use that uh, that argument. Now, um, what are the arguments for Islam? You might be asking if those aren't the, uh, if those popular arguments aren't have are outdated or whatever. Well, there's three pieces of evidence we can use to prove Islam is true. And the first evidence would be um, uh, scientific accuracy in the Quran. And uh, Muslims have to be careful with this, and I'll, I'll get into why. I'll get into why in, in a little bit. Uh, prophecies in the Quran, pro fulfilled, fulfilled prophecies in the Quran, and fulfilled prophecies in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So there's verses in the Quran that prophesized events that later on came true, and there are prophecies Prophet Muhammad gave which later on came true. And archaeological archaeological digs actually proved the Quran. So that's another. Um, so these are the three um, arguments that Muslims can make to prove that the Quran and uh, the Prophet Muhammad were, you know, the Quran supernaturally inspired, and that the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, um, was, uh, you know, was inspired by God to give correct prophecies and stuff like that. Uh, another mirror, another. Uh, piece of evidence which is minor but you know I used to use it but I don't use it anymore is that there are a lot of supernatural things that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him did so Prophet Muhammad performed miracles kind of like how Jesus performed miracles um, you know in the in the New Testament like healing the sick etc etc Prophet Muhammad also performed miracles for example if you read the authentic hadith of Sayyid al-Bukhari Sayyid Muslim and stuff like that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was able to pray for rain and rain would rain down in Arabia or, or the Prophet Muhammad was able to heal people and uh, you know he was able to uh, you know have water come out of his hands and uh, stuff like that so the Prophet Muhammad was able to do a lot of supernatural um, events or he was able to do a lot of supernatural things uh, and this is one of the miracles uh, or this is one of the powers God gave him is that Prophet Muhammad was able to do miracles just like Jesus was allowed to do miracles and I guess the, the most famous miracle of the Prophet Muhammad uh, other than the Quran would be uh, the splitting of the moon where the Prophet Muhammad said uh, where the pagan Meccans didn't believe that he was a prophet so he said show us a miracle so he said look at the moon and then he split the moon in half and put the moon and the moon came back together and this is fun in Sayyid al-Bukhari and this is found in uh, Tafsir ibn Kathir and stuff like that. So this is a famous miracle of the Prophet Muhammad. It's called the Prophet Muhammad and splitting of the moon. So Prophet Muhammad performed many miracles and this is found in authentic hadith books. Authentic hadith books meaning Sayyid al-Bukhari, Sayyid Muslim, etc. Uh, etc. Et um, you know, Abu Dawood, you know, it's authentic hadith collections. So let's get into the first, um, let's get into the first piece of evidence would be uh, scientific accuracy of the Quran. Now, um, now when I say scientific accuracy, I think there's only there's only a few scientific statements that people before the Quran didn't know and that, that the Quran is confirming today. For example, um, you know, another outdated argument made for the Quran would be the embryo embryology argument of the Prophet Muhammad or the Quran predicted uh, modern embryology and uh, you know the Greeks had some idea of this and the Romans had some idea of, of embryology and, and things like that so I think Galen you know had ideas of embryology so um, so uh, you know this the embryology the embry embryology argument is kind of outdated so there's some uh, there's some scientific accuracy accurate statements in the Quran which you know don't hold up or they're outdated or people before the Quran knew about it so um, 
you know, even though the Quran gets everything about science right, but these are just some of the, uh, uh, you know, kind of outdated arguments. So I don't use this, um, I don't use this this argument of embryology, et cetera, et cetera. So let's look at the uh, scientific evidence for Islam. The first unique, the, the first unique piece of evidence. Uh, or the first unique scientific evidence. And the first unique scientific evidence would be would find would be in the Quran chapter twenty four verse forty. Now um, now you might be saying, well uh, well critics of the Quran say that why why do Muslims believe in the Quran? The Quran is uh, fourteen hundred years ago and you know it was man made and, and things like that. Well um, well you know this these evidence these evidences prove that the Quran could not have been written by man. Uh, rather, a supernatural source must have been involved. Uh, for example, we find statements in the Quran uh, which agree with modern science, which has only been recently discovered. So this is uh, so obviously a man living in the desert 1,400 years ago would not have you know knowledge of these scientific facts. There's no way that you know an Arab living in the middle of the de Arabian desert would have known all this stuff. It's it's, it's impossible. So the Prophet Muhammad was supernaturally inspired by God, and that supernatural evidence would, would be um, confirmed by the, as, by the uh, scientifically accurate statements in the Quran and the prophecies in the Quran and the prophecies the Prophet Muhammad made uh, that later on came true. So let's get into the first piece of evidence, which would be um, first scientific, scientifically correct statement, which would be the Quran chapter 24 verse 40, where uh, where Allah says in the Quran, or is is like the darkness in the de and, uh, in a vast deep sea, overwhelmed with a great wave topped by a great wave, topped by dark clouds, darkness one above the other. If man stretches out his hand, he can hardly see it. And he for whom Allah has not appointed light, uh, for him there is no light. So, um, so what this verse is saying is that there is um, that there are there is. Uh, that in the deep, uh, vast seas there are great waves toppled by great waves. Um, so, uh, so the Arabic word used in that verse would be fi. Uh, fi means in. So, um, so, uh, so what this verse is saying? This verse is saying two things. This verse is saying that there's darkness in the sea, and uh, uh, and that there's waves, that there's internal waves in the ocean. So. Uh, so what this means is that um, so this is scientifically correct. Like if you if you if you read anything about um, if you read anything about like the seas and stuff like that in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, there's no it's complete darkness. It's all dark down there. So there's no light. So um, so the proper so the Quran is saying that there's no light in the bottom of the ocean, and uh, this is a scientifically correct uh, statement that there indeed there is no uh, there is no uh, light in the bottom of the ocean. So a man living 1,400 years ago uh, could not have known this. Now some might say, well, the pre-Islamic uh, there's a pre-Islamic source called the Iliad um, that says there's there was a dark sea. But uh, nowhere in that source, in the Iliad, does it say there's no light. Only in the Quran does it say there's no light in the um, in the bottom of the uh, in the bottom of the sea or the bottom of the ocean. And that's that's scientifically correct. If you keep going down and down and down to the ocean, there's it's all dark. There's no light in there. And this is scientifically confirmed. Um, I'll, be, I'll be posting all the the links um, down by science by scientific websites down that show there's no light in the bottom of the ocean. So um, how would the author of the Quran know this? Uh, you know they didn't have submarines 1,400 years ago, so uh, there's no way that the Prophet Muhammad would have known that there's no light in the bottom of the um, in the bottom of the uh, uh, bottom of the ocean or bottom of the sea. So this is a scientifically correct statement, and if you read the Iliad, uh, the, the alleged pre-Islamic source that says this, it says that it says that she plunged into the dark sea. It doesn't say there's darkness in the sea. So in the Quran, it says there's darkness in in the vast ocean. There's darkness in the bot, and um, you know and this is correct. The bottom, the deeper you go in the ocean, the less light there is, and then until you reach the very bottom of the ocean, it's all dark. There's no light in there. 
So how would, uh, without some supernatural help, the Prophet Muhammad would have been, wouldn't have known this. Uh, so this this proves that the author of the Quran that the author of the Quran is a supernatural force, and that supernatural force is Allah is God. So what about the what about the other um, what about the other ver what about the other scientific statement in this verse? It says there it's overwhelmed with a wave toppled by a great wave. So what the Quran is saying is that there's internal waves in the ocean, um, you know. So it, um, so it's not just in the surface. The Arabic word for in is feet, and it's used in the verse. So uh, there's uh, so you know if you read the Arabic, it says feet. That means there's waves in the ocean. Uh, so, um, so the so the Quran is saying there's waves, there's internal waves in the ocean. This is a scientifically correct fact. Yeah, anybody who does research on the oceans knows that there's internal waves in the ocean. So, someone 1,400 years ago would not have known. And what I mean, waves in the ocean, I mean waves in the middle of the ocean and stuff like that. So, there's no way like someone like Prophet Muhammad peace be upon would have known this scientifically correct fact because 1,400 years ago they didn't have. Uh, they didn't have uh, you know submarines and stuff like that so there was no way they could go in the middle of the ocean or the bottom of the ocean uh, uh, without you know drowning and stuff like that because they didn't have scuba scuba diving gear and they didn't have submarines and stuff like that back then so this is a scientifically correct fact that no one before the Quran knew about the Greeks didn't know about this the Romans didn't know about this the Egyptians the Berbers uh, you, you know the Chinese Indians uh, Iranians uh, pre-islamic people didn't know about this fact so that's one of the um, that's one of the arguments uh, you know I have is how the author of the Quran know uh, that there's internal waves in the ocean and there's bottom of the there's uh, no light in the bottom of the ocean without some supernatural help you wouldn't have known this now um, what about the other uh, scientifically correct uh, facts in the um, Quran well there's some there's some other uh, there's some other scientifically correct facts in the Quran for example the Quran says uh, that uh, The Quran says that there, um, you know, that there's physical barriers in the in the seas, and this is found in the Quran, chapter 55, verse 19 and 20. So, I mean, this is science has confirmed this fact that the, there is some barriers in the in the ocean. So, uh, but some might say, well, the barriers are observable, or sailors told the Prophet Muhammad this fact and stuff like that. But my question is, how would the Prophet Muhammad have known to put this in the Quran? Um, you know, so uh, these these are uh, this is an invisible barrier. It, this and this invisible barrier is called uh, pi uh, pi no sea So um, so there are barriers in the sea, and science has confirmed this fact. Um, so this is a modern scientific fact that the that the Quran um, that the Quran confirms. Uh, you know, nobody before the Quran knew this, so, um, you know, and uh, things like that. Assalamu alaikum and hello to my non-Muslim viewers. Today I'm going to be talking about, uh, this is part two of Evidence for Islam, part two of two. So here we go. Uh, in the first video I talked about outdated uh, arguments uh, for the Evidence for Islam, like the mathematical miracle, of the Quran, which is too complicated to prove, and uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad predicted in the in the Bible or the Old Testament and New Testament. And again, th those are also complicated, and that's also uh, difficult to prove. And it's not necessary to prove Prophet Muhammad is in the Old Testament, and New Testament, because, like I said in the first video, uh, you know, according to Tafsir Ibn Kathir, Tafsir Ibn Abbas, Al Zamakshuri, uh, Tafsir Al Razi, etc., etc., Prophet Muhammad is in. Uh, the Torah revealed to Moses and the Injil or the Gospel revealed to Jesus and the Torah of Moses the Torah of Moses is not the Old Testament uh, or is not the first five books of the Old Testament Gen Genesis Leviticus Numbers Exodus Deuteronomy and the Injil uh, uh, that the Quran talks about is not the uh, New Testament that we have today the New Testament being the Gospels of Matthew Mark Luke and John the Epistles of Paul uh, Revelation Acts uh, etc etc one Peter, two Peter. It's not that. So uh, the Quran has a different view on what the Torah and Injil is and stuff like that. 
So in this video, I want to talk about the second part uh, for the evidence for Islam and um, or how to prove that Islam is true and stuff like that. Now, uh, some uh, some critics or some critics of Islam will say, well, you can say the same thing about the Bible. You can say the Bible has scientific accuracy or the Bible has fulfilled prophecies and stuff like that. And this is actually uh, false because there's a lot of scientific errors in the Bible. Uh, both the Old and New Testament, which aren't found in the Quran. So, you know, that, that argument falls apart. And uh, as for prophecies, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of failed prophecies in both the Old and New Testament. Uh, for example, um, you know, a famous example is if you read the New Testament, it says Jesus is coming back in the lifetime uh, of the disciples and stuff like that. And Jesus, uh, and the end of the world is, you know, near and stuff like that. But clearly it's not the end of the world and uh, things like that. So, you know, Jesus made a false prophecy according to the new Testament. Uh, so there's all kinds of failed prophecies in the, in the new Testament and, uh, um, things like that. Even Paul thought we were living in the end of days, uh, you know, but this is clearly false. It's two, it's 2000 years later, you see. So, you know, this, this argument that, uh, there's prophecies in the Bible and there's scientific accuracy in the Bible has been debunked over and over again. There's this really good website called Skeptic Undated Un Un Bible, which I'll be posting below, where they post a bunch of failed prophecies and scientific errors and absurdities of the Bible, which you don't find in the Quran. So, you know, so the Prophet Muhammad was really, you know, plagiarizing off the Bible. How did he avoid the mistakes in the Bible? You see, so that argument falls apart. Another argument Christians would use is the argument from arche archaeological diggings that prove the Old Testament or, or, you know, and stuff like that. Well, this is a long topic. I can't really get into it right now because I'm trying to keep this video as short as possible. But uh, a book I would, a good book I would recommend that debunks that claim that archaeological diggings confirmed the, the Old Testament would be the Bible on Earth. Um, you know, and this book completely debunks the idea that there's archaeological, you know, findings in the Old Testament and stuff like that. Uh, you know, so I just recommend uh, people buying and reading that book by the Bible on Earth. And I'll be posting a link to that to where you can buy that book and read that book below in the description. So, you know, and um, so what about the evidence for Islam? You know, uh, the evidence for Islam. Now, some might say that the, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, copy these prophecies or these scientific error, scientific accuracies and stuff like that from uh, he copied off like the Greeks and the ancient Romans and the Egyptians and stuff like that and the Babylonians and this is false because all the prophecies and all the scientific scientifically accurate statements I stay I'm going to state in this video and in part one of one of the previous video all these um, scientific claims in these these uh, prophecies were not found uh, anywhere else they weren't found they weren't found with the Greeks or the Romans or uh, anything like that so these are unique prophecies or these are unique scientific accurate statements found in the Quran and the uh, Hadith. These aren't found in the Hindu scriptures or the ancient Greek and Roman books or, you know, the Babylonians and Egyptians and uh, uh, the ancient Iranians. This isn't found anywhere else. This isn't found in any pre-Islamic source. I'll just put it that way. It doesn't matter if it's Roman, Greek, uh, you know, Egyptian, etc., etc. So what are, what are the other, you know, prophecies or what are the other um, scientifically accurate statements found in the uh, in the Quran and stuff like that. Well, uh, another uh, another prophecy would be um, that uh, the 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 Quran um, talks about a lot of things that. Uh, for example, the Quran was revealed in two stages in Mecca and Medina. So um, the uh, the Prophet Muhammad you know, received or the prophet Allah revealed most of the surahs found in the Quran in the Makkan period. And that's the first 13 years of the prophet Muhammad's life. So, you know, um, a majority of the Quran is from Makkah and, uh, and only like 28 surahs or something like that is the Medina is found in, you know, the Medinian chapters of the Quran. 
So the Quran was revealed in two stages. So one unique prophecy that the Quran brings is um, the prophecy that the Romans would defeat the Persians. Uh, and this is found in the Quran chapter 30, which I will be uh, quoting uh, right now. According to according to the Quran, uh, chapter thirty, of verse one through five, it says, "Alif la rim, alif lam rim, mim, alif lam mim." The Romans, which is the Byzantine, or the translation says Byzantines, have been defeated in the Hilther land, in the nearer land, but they, after their defeat, will soon be victorious in less than ten years. For decisions with Allah initially as well as subsequently, and on that day the believers shall rejoice at the victory given to given to them by Allah. He helps whomever He wills, and He is the most mighty, the most merciful. Quran chapter thirty, verse one through five. So this um, this uh, this passage. Uh, uh, ge uh, graphically, uh, graphically portrays the situation between the Byzantines and the Persians, as well as the believers and unbelievers in Mecca. So this this is the Quran chapter thirty, and the Quran chapter thirty was revealed in um, it was revealed uh, in Mecca, and this the exact date that the surah was revealed was in the Quran chapter was uh, I'm sorry was in 614 CE Christian era so 614 this chapter was revealed so um so this passage states that so this passage is basically prophesizing two things it's prophesizing that the Romans will defeat the Persians um uh, you know, within you know, within the time frame, within the timeline of ten years, and this uh, this uh, this verse or this Quran, these Quranic verses are saying that the Muslims will gain victory. Uh, the Muslims will gain victory um, by Allah. Um, you know, uh, by Allah in the in the future. So these prophecies can. So the Quran is basically prophesizing two things: that the Romans will defeat the Persians. And the uh, Muslims will defeat the uh, the the Muslims will have victory. They'll have their first victory uh, over you know the Meccans or whatever. And these prophecies came true. Um, you know, according to uh, according to you know history books and uh, things like that. Um, you know, the there was a the the Romans gained their first victory over the Persians in a Heraclius campaign of 622. So, uh, you know, if you read the you know history books and uh, things like that, um, the history of the Roman wars with the Persians, the the Romans um, beat the Persians in 622, which was uh, which was about like eight years. Um, which is about eight years after this Quranic verse was revealed. So, um, you know, within it, it fits the time frame because the Quran says that uh, within uh, in less than ten years, the Romans would defeat the Persians, and that that came true um, in uh, 622 uh, CE Christian era. So, um, so this is so this is this Quranic prophecy came true. Um, the second, uh, the second prophecy that um, came true was um, the uh, the the uh, the Battle of uh, Badr. So the Muslims were fighting the non the the Muslims started fighting the the uh, pagan Meccans, uh, you know, in the Battle of Badr, and they won. The Muslims won their first battle. Uh, you know, against the Persians, and uh, you know, in, in the Battle of Badr, which was uh, in 624 uh, CE. Um, you know, uh, so the uh, the Muslims uh, obtained their first victory at Badr. So this is a correct prophecy, which um, which which the Quran gives, which was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, which the which Allah gives to Prophet Muhammad. And this these two prophecies came true. The Romans were de the Romans defeated the Persians in um, you know in Heraclius campaign of 622. Uh, you know, and I'll be posting the link to that in the bottom with all the you know scholarly citations and stuff like that that shows according to history the the Romans beat the Persians eight years after this verse was revealed and um, which is the Heraclius campaign of 622 and uh, the Muslims won in the Battle of Badr uh, in 623 or 624 CE 
So the mo so this passage was basically prophesizing that the Muslims would win and the Romans would win, and these two prophecies came true. So the Prophet Muhammad uh, only had, uh, you know, he only had a one out of two chance. He only had, um, you know, one in two chance of having this prophecy come true. Because what if the Persians won against the Romans later on, or the Persians crushed the Romans, or what if the the, the in the Battle of Badr the pagan Meccans defeated the the Muslims? So the Prophet Muhammad made you know if he was if the prophet Muhammad was really the author of the quran then you know he would have destroyed his credibility if the muslims were defeated in Badr or and the persians beat the romans uh you know eight years later but since the prophet Muhammad was speaking out of revelation from god these prophecies came true so um the quran says it's not the word of a man it's it's the word of god and this is found in the quran chapter 53 verse 2 to 6 so the prophet moment doesn't speak out of his own desire he speaks whatever god or whatever allah revealed to him so this is a true prophecy of uh of the quran and this is this is more proof or this is more evidence that the quran came from a supernatural source being allah because the prophet moment would have never um you know made up this verse he, he would have never uh said that uh you know if the prophet one was really making things up then and if these prophecies didn't come true then a lot of people would have had doubts about the quran or the prophet of the moment so since muhammad was a true prophet since he was revealing whatever Allah told him to do then in the future uh, you know we see that these prophecies came true because the the Quran is not the word of a man it's the man it's the word of God um, so you know this is more proof or this is more evidence that the Quran was supernaturally inspired or uh, God is the author of the Quran since the Quran says it's the word of God uh, you know in the Quran chapter 53 verse 2 to 6 of the Quran chapter 2 verse 1 through 3 etc etc so Muhammad isn't the author of the uh, Quran um, so, um, what about, uh, now you might be saying, what other prophecies or what other things are there mentioned in the Quran? And, uh, according to the Quran, chapter 74, verse, uh, uh, 24 to 28, it talks about the fate of Walid ibn, uh, Moghira. Walid ibn Moghira was a, uh, enemy of the Prophet Muhammad in Mecca. And uh, what the Quran is saying is that the Quran uh, is that Walid ibn uh, Mughira um, uh, thought that the Quran was just uh, the word of a mortal man, or it was the word of a man. And uh, and the Quran says that the Walid ibn Mughira would be thrown in hell. So what? Um, so this prophecy came true because Walid ibn Mughira. Uh, never converted, never believed in the Quran, and never repented from, you know, uh, repented uh, out of fear of going to hell. So if Walid ibn Mughira uh, converted to Islam, or if he started believing in the Quran, or if he started repenting out of fear of being thrown in hell, then a lot of people would have had doubts about the Quran or what the Prophet Muhammad was saying, or whether the Quran's from the, the Word of God or the, or the Word of the Prophet Muhammad. But since, since this revelation states uh, that Muhammad uh, Walid ibn Mughira would never accept the Quran and never repent out of going to hell and he would never convert to Islam indirectly and the Quran is saying he would indirectly that he will never convert to Islam and that's um, that's true Walid ibn Mughira died um, fighting against Islam so uh, all Walid ibn Mughira had to do was say you know uh, I believe in the Quran or he all he had to do was say I, uh, I I repent out of fear of going to hell then a lot of people would have had doubts about Islam or the prophet Muhammad's prophethood would have been proven false but that's not the case uh, some supernatural force knew in advance that Walid ibn Mughira would die um, going to would die you know fighting against not believing the Quran and would die never um, never repenting out of fear of going to hell so the author of the Quran knew Walid ibn Mughira's ultimate fate which was opposing the Quran and uh, you know just you know being too proud or too arrogant to uh, say that uh, to repent out of to repent uh, out of fear of being thrown in hell 
So this prophecy about Walid ibn Mughira came true. So that's further proof that the Quran is not the word of man. Because if the Quran is the word of man, then you know, then in in, in if uh, Walid ibn Mughira uh, uh, converted to Islam, then proving disproving these verses, then a lot of people would have then the Quran. This would have been proven that the Quran's man-made, but some supernatural force knew that Walid ibn Mughira would never. Um, believe in the Quran as the word of God and you would never uh, repent out of fear of going to hell and, and the Quran is indirectly not directly but indirectly saying Walid ibn Mughira would never convert to Islam or he'll never believe in the Quran or he'll never believe in you know uh, the prophet of Muhammad or he'll never believe in or he'll never repent from going to hell so and these these things came to pass these things came true so this is further proof that the Quran wasn't authored by man some supernatural source must have been involved same thing with Abu Lahab Abu Lahab is mentioned in the Quran chapter uh, in, the, in the Quran chapter 111 so uh, the Quran says that uh, Abu Lahab would would go to hell and people who go to hell are the people who reject Islam or reject uh, the Prophet of the moment and reject the Quran and stuff like that so Abu Lahab so this verse was revealed in the early Meccan period so Abu Lahab had and then Abu Lahab died in the Battle of Badr so Abu Lahab had like 10 years to believe in the Quran as the word of God or had 10 years to repent uh, from going to hell but he never did so what this uh, so the Quran so God or Allah knew in advance that Abu Lahab would never repent from going to hell and he would never believe in the Quran as the word of God so 10 years is a long time so this verse was revealed um, you know in I think uh, 6 uh, 612 CE and uh, you know the Battle of Badr happened in 624 623 uh, CE so that's 10 years 10 years is a long time for someone to accept the Quran or to repent from fear of being thrown in hell but Abu Lahab never repented um, out of fear of being thrown in hell and Abu Lahab never uh, believed that the word is uh, never believed that the Quran is the word of Allah or never is the word of God so Abu Lahab never converted to Islam and Abu Lahab never um, you know he never believed in the Prophet of Muhammad he never believed in Islam the Quran etc etc so some supernatural force knew that um, you know he would he would die he would you know die in a state of disbelief that he would die uh, you know never believing the Quran never believing uh, you know the Prophet of Muhammad and never believing uh, that he would be you know thrown in or never repenting that he would be thrown in hell so this is these are uh, so there's some supernatural force that knew in advance that Abu Lahab would uh, never repent out of fear of going to hell or uh, Walid ibn Mughira would also you know die disbelieving the Quran die uh, uh, never repenting out of fear of being thrown in hell and stuff like that so this is further proof that the Quran is not the word of a man it's a word of a supernatural force and that's Allah because Allah knew in advance that Abu Lahab and Walid uh, uh, Walid ibn Mughira would die opposing would die in a state would die in a states of disbelief they would die never believing the Quran they would die never repenting out of fear of being thrown in hell and you know these verses were revealed at least 10 10 to 8 years um, 10 11 11 to 10 10 to 11 years uh, before the Battle of Badr so that's a long time to believe in the Quran that's a long time to believe to have time to believe in the Quran or even out Outwardly, they could have outwardly said that we believe in the Quran or we believe in Islam, we believe in the Prophet Muhammad, we believe in, uh, you know, we we repent out of fear of being thrown to hell. So a lot of enemies of of Islam, like uh, Umar bin Khattab, converted to Islam and stuff like that. So Umar bin Khattab and uh, you know other early enemies of Islam converted to Islam. Uh, you know, uh, why is it so? Why is it that Abu Lahab and Walid ibn Mughira would die in a state of disbelief as Prophet? in the Quran so this is further proof that the Quran is not the word of man it's a word of some supernatural force and that supernatural force is uh, is Allah or is God so you know this is just uh, you know these are just uh, some of the um, arguments or some of the prophecies of the Quran
So there's no way the Quran was written by by a mortal or wasn't written by a man because how would the Prophet Muhammad correctly know that the Romans would defeat the Persians, that the Muslims would gain victory in the Battle of Badr, that uh, what would know that Walid ibn Mughira and Abu Lahab would die, uh, you know, die in states of disbelief, would die never even outwardly, even pretending or outwardly converting to Islam or uh, believing the Quran or repenting out of fear of being thrown to hell etc etc um, another prophecy of the Muslim victory in the Battle of Badr is the Quran chapter 54 verse 45 where it says that um, the Muslims would uh, would gain victory over the, the the Meccans and again this prophecy came true and the Quran chapter 54 verse 45 was revealed in Mecca and uh, the Battle of Badr um, uh, came true uh, two years after the Prophet Muhammad migrated to Medina. So this prophecy of the Muslims uh, uh, gaining victory in the Battle of Badr uh, in the Quran chapter 54 verse 45 came true, um, you know, years later. So this is further proof that that there's no way, you know, the Quran was written by a man, some supernatural force. Allah must have been involved in revealing the uh, Quran. So. Um, you know, so uh, that's just some of the prophecies of the Quran. So what about the prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him? Now, some might say, well, what makes Muhammad a prophet or why should we believe that, uh, why should we believe in, um, you know, the prophet or the Prophet Muhammad? What kind of prophecies did he give and stuff like that? Um, the Prophet Muhammad did give true prophecies. Uh, according to the Prophet Muhammad, there would be a, um, there would be a uh, fire in the uh, land of Hijaz. Now, what is the land of... Um, so, I'll, I'll read the Hadith right now. It says, uh, uh, narrated by Abu Huraira, Allah's Apostle said, the hour, which is the judgment day, the, the hour will not be established till a fire will come out of the land of Hijaz and it will throw light on the necks of the camels of Basra. And Basra is all the way in Iraq, modern day Iraq. And this is found in uh, Sayy al Bukhari, volume 9, page 152, hadith number 7118. So this hadith is contained in um, Bukhari Sahih, and Bukhari died in 256 after Hijra. Sayy Bukhari had had been published during his lifetime and was included in the courses of Islamic studies. The fire in the fire in the land of Hijaz came true in 654 uh, after Hijra, about four centuries after the death of Imam al-Bukhari. The fire had been developed by volcanic eruption and there are many books on the subject. Several scholars uh, attest to this fact. Ibn Kathir in his book al Nihaya al fitan al Malahim, Volume 1, page 14, narrates that more than one person in Basra at the time of the incident uh, that they saw the necks of the camels from the light of the fire that appeared in the land of Hijaz. Imam al Qurtubi in his book Al Daz Daz Dazgira, page 636, states that the fire was seen from Makkah and the mountains of Basra. Um, you know, and, and uh, confirmation of the fire of fire in the land of Hijaz is also found in Imam Nawawi's book, uh, Sira Sar Sira, uh, Muslim, volume 18, page 28, and Ibn Hajar Askalani's book, uh, Fat al Buri, volume 13, page uh, 79. And uh, confirmation of this event is also found in, uh, or fulfillment of this prophecy is also found in um, Sayyid al-Bukhari, volume 9, page 152, in the footnote. So this is a correct prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that there would be a fire in the land of Hijaz and that fire would, uh, that fire would be all the way to, you know, that fire would extend all the way to Basra and Basra is in Iraq. So what other prophecy did the Prophet Muhammad give? The Prophet Muhammad also said that Arabia will return to being meadows and rivers in Sahih Muslim, uh, volume 3, page 1556, hadith number 2339. So what's um, what's uh, what's unique about this is the Prophet Muhammad said Arabia will return, will go back to being meadows with rivers. Uh, so according to the Quran, chapter 26, verse 133 to 134, uh, Arabia or the people of Ad, the people of Ad and the people of Hud were. Um, we're in Arabia, and in the Quran states that uh, you know the people of Ad and the people of Hud were blessed with um, rivers and livestock, and um, 
uh, you know, gardens and springs and stuff like that. So what the author of the Quran is saying is that Arabia at one point had a lot of forest and a lot of grass and a lot of meadows and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of rivers and springs and cattle and stuff like that. And uh, this is scientifically correct because if you, if you look up the history of Arabia, Arabia wasn't always a desert. It was at one point Arabia was, uh, you know, all green it was all grass and there were trees and you know stuff in Arabia so uh, according to you know according to scientists and stuff like that Arabia at one point was all like forest and you know there was like springs and there was you know grass and all that and then humans migrated out of Africa and then they went to Arabia and then from Arabia they went to uh, you know India and you know Asia Asia would be you know China you know Japan and then the native uh, the native americans went all the way to america and stuff like that so human migration went from africa to africa to arabia to india to um you know to uh to asia to you know north america and japan and stuff like that and if you believe in the um out of india theory which states that indo-europeans went from india to uh europe so you know from india they went from india uh, people migrated all the way to europe and then they became you know um caucasians or they became uh you know white europeans or stuff like you believe in that theory so uh you know that kind of that kind of um that kind of confirms the uh uh, out of India theory, but you know, whatever, uh, but that's, that's a separate topic. So anyways, Arabia was at one point, um, you know, it was green or it was the ground saying it was green. It was, uh, there was grass and, you know, there was rivers and stuff like that. And this is scientifically correct. Uh, back in pre-Islamic times, Arabia was all a desert All back in biblical times. And back, if you read the ancient Greek and Roman writers and stuff like that, they would also attest that Arabia was a desert. There was no, um, you know, there was no grass or there was no forest and stuff like that in Arabia. So Arabia became a desert, um, you know, uh, at least uh, 15,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago or 20,000, whatever it is. But, you know, um, but at one point in, pre in prehistorical times, uh, Arabia was green. There, there was green with grass and rivers and meadows and uh, trees and stuff like that. So then later on, Arabia became a desert. So there's no way the Prophet Muhammad would have known that, uh, you know, Arabia was green and stuff like that without some super was a uh, had forest and was grass and so uh, grass like and stuff like that because without some supernatural force telling him to telling him it was. So uh, the Prophet Muhammad is saying that Arabia will return to being meadows with rivers and stuff like that, and this prophecy came true. Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to be posting a uh, link below where it shows that Arabia is turning green and stuff like that. Or there's forest and stuff like that. Uh, there's, I'm sorry, there's trees and grass growing out of Arabia. And this is, uh, and this NASA confirms this. So, you know, this isn't some pro-Muslim website saying this. Uh, this is NASA saying this. So, uh, you know, this is further proof that the, uh, that the author of the Quran uh, couldn't, be, couldn't have been a man or couldn't have been Prophet Muhammad because I was the Prophet Muhammad uh, saying something correct that science would later on, uh, how would the Prophet Muhammad be so sure to say that Arabia was green and there was, uh, you know, rivers and uh, springs and stuff like that and, and trees and forests uh, in the Quran? Um, how would he know to put that in the Quran? If I were the Prophet Muhammad and if I was making up the Quran, I would say, yeah, Arabia at that time was a desert because, you know, Arabia at the time of the Prophet Muhammad was all a desert or it was all, you know, there was no trees or there was barely any trees or it was all sand and stuff like that. So if, if if the author of the Quran was Muhammad, then he would have said, yeah, Arabia was always sand and stuff. Like, it was always a desert. But but no, the Quran is making a scientifically correct statement that Arabia was green at one point. Or there was there was forest and, and grass and trees and stuff like that. So, you know, how would the Prophet Muhammad know this? The Prophet, Prophet Muhammad wouldn't have known this without some supernatural help. So it says that uh, the Prophet Muhammad said that Arabia will return to being meadows with rivers and uh, stuff like that. So it would be green again. And again, this is found in Sahih Muslim, volume 3, page 56, hadith number 2. 
2339 and, it, and, and indeed this prophecy came true because uh you know if you, uh, there's uh according to nasa and according to uh you know people who visited saudi arabia and stuff like that and i'm going to be posting the the links below where they show that there's trees coming out of arabia and there's forest and uh grass is coming out and uh you know even nasa is confirming that yeah arabia is turning green or there's uh uh there's trees coming out and there's grass coming out and stuff like that so there's some kind of greenery in arabia and stuff like that so the proper moments prophecy is coming true arabia is becoming green and it's me is having meadows and uh it's it's becoming like a forest again with you know natural uh grass and green and greenery coming and stuff like that and there's even you know i heard of some like saudi arabians doing uh are putting like uh grass artificial grass and uh things like that in their um in their in their areas and stuff like that so this prophecy is coming true uh both naturally and artificially uh with saudi arabians uh uh, uh putting greenery in in their in their areas and stuff like that and again i'll post the links below what other prophecy did the prophet moment give uh, another prophecy the prophet moment gave was um uh, that the Arabs will compete in uh, building taller buildings, higher buildings. And this is found, and this hadith is found in Sayyid al Bukhari, volume 1, page 81, uh, hadith number 50. So again, this prophecy came true where, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, the Arabs are competing in building tall buildings. For example, in Dubai, Dubai has the tallest building in the world, the uh, Burj Khalifa, uh, which is currently the highest uh or the tallest building in the world and saudi arabia is also building is building a building that's going to beat that dubai building it's going to be like the tallest uh building in the world um in saudi arabia is building the tallest building in the world uh you know so um so saudi arabia is going to d beat the dubai the dubai building because dubai has currently has the highest building or the tallest building in the world and saudi arabia said they're going to build a building uh that's uh that's taller than the big than the burj khalifa uh in dubai so saudi arabia is going to beat uh dubai just like the proper moment prophesies that the arabs will compete in building higher buildings this is true because people in dubai and people in saudi arabia are obviously you know bedouin or arabs and you know the arabs now are competing with building tall buildings dubai was the first was the first uh arab uh nation to build the Burj khalifa and now saudi arabia is saudi arabia which is also an arab nation is going to beat the Burj khalifa by building the tallest building in the in the world of uh, beating the Burj khalifa which is currently the uh, tallest building in the world so how would the prophet moment peace be upon him know that the arabs would build would compete in building tall buildings which is happening today uh you know uh which is happening today in the 2000 in 2000 uh you know 18 and and uh i think the Burj khalifa was uh, built in uh 2008 or something like that 2007 i can't remember when it was built but it was built in the late 2000s i i think and now saudi arabia is going to beat them by building a tall by a building taller than that so the proper moment uh correctly prophesized uh, uh these things so you know that's just uh that's just some of the um arguments to show that there's no way that the prophet Muhammad uh was making up the quran and there's uh and the prophet Muhammad was uh, uh prophesizing things to come whether it's the scientifically accurate statements of you know like uh um uh, uh darkness in the sea and internal waves in the ocean and uh prophecies of the quran like jews uh, fighting the muslims from behind behind the wall or the, the the quran predicting that the romans would beat the persians uh you know way before it actually happened or the muslims would win in the battle of Badr, uh way before you know muslims actually won in the battle of Badr, and uh you know and the prophecies of the prophet muhammad uh saying things like uh you know or Arabia will become green again or uh, you know um uh, Arabs will compete in ta building tall buildings and stuff like that. These are very specific prophecies. There's no way the Prophet Muhammad got lucky in guessing these things to come. So this is pr further proof of the supernatural that Prophet Muhammad in the Quran uh, uh, were you know in influenced or they were uh, influenced by the inspiration of Allah or God. So this is further proof uh, of this, and uh, you know, there's uh, there's other prophecies. For example, the Prophet Muhammad said 
that uh, said that there would be sexually new trans sexually transmitted diseases that would come uh, that would come later on, and this is found in Sunan Ibn Majah, Volume Five, Hadith Number uh, uh, Sunan Ibn Majah, Volume Five, Page uh, One Hundred Eighteen to One Hundred Nineteen, Hadith Number Four Thousand and Nineteen, where the problem said that new sexually transmitted diseases would uh, would would come to people who who are sexually mischievous and have um, lots of sexual partners and stuff like that, and uh, um, that uh, people would, uh, would commit immorality, uh, uh, immor immorality openly, and this is true because you know you have pornography and television and you know and stuff like that, and um, you know you would have uh, and uh, you know for example uh, the uh, Japanese scientists have found that there's a new um, sexually transmitted disease uh, known as the uh, superbug known as the gonorrhea superbug and this is a new sexually transmitted disease so just like the problem prophesized new sexually transmitted diseases are happening because people are having uh you know multiple sexual partners or they're being sexually immoral and uh uh, stuff like that. So the prophet Muhammad prophesized new sexually transmitted diseases, and these this prophecy came true. Uh, you know, there's a few good books. Uh, you know, I just recommend people to read about all the prophecies prophet Muhammad gave and the fulfillment the fulfillment of these prophecies, whether it's now or back then. And this is uh, in in a good book to buy if you want to see the complete list of all the prophecies prophet Muhammad gave. Would be this book, the Book of the End. Uh, great trials and tribulations by uh, Ibn Kathir uh, and it was translated by Faisal uh, Shafiq so this is a really good book called the book of the end which talks about you know great trials and tribulations and all the prophecies prophet Muhammad peace be upon him gave which later on came true so I would just recommend this book the book of the end and another book I would recommend would be uh, this book uh, which is smaller signs of the day of the day compiled by Muhammad bin uh, by Yumi where he uh, really goes into you know the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad uh, peace be upon him whether it's prophecies being fulfilled today or back then uh, you know and then he, he shows why there's a uh, uh, you know, he, he tells uh, why these uh, why these prophecies are, um, you know, uh, uh, fulfilled and stuff like that. For example, uh, you know, he uh, he talks about uh, he he talks about how there's uh, importing of uh, non-Muslim servants, uh, you know, for um, and uh, you know that's true. Uh, yeah, that the Muslims would uh, one day. Um, be served by the people of uh, Rome and the people of Persia and that's true because if you go to Saudi Arabia or if you go to Dubai and stuff like that there are a large number of foreign servants working in the Gulf region uh, you know and these people are, are a source of trials and tribulations and stuff like that and this is authentic hadith and he also goes on to uh, state that um, you know that uh, uh, that you know mosque will be decorated uh, or muslims will compete in building uh you know mosque and stuff like that and this is a correct prophecy if you go to turkey and if you go to the middle east and uh, things like that there are beautiful uh big constructions of mosque and stuff like that and uh uh you know even though the prophet Muhammad said don't don't adorn mosque don't uh, don't compete in ma in building mosque and stuff like that but this is true if you go to like uh, turkey saudi arabia you know uh, uh you know other muslim countries iran uh you know these other muslim majority countries uh you see like these big buildings of mosque and stuff like that even though they're uh they're doing what or they're doing what the prophet would prophesy where people would compete in building nicer mosques and uh stuff like that so you know the, you know and there's other you know there's other prophecies here which later on came true um, you know, for example, tyranny and oppressors would be the um, would be um, you know witnessed in in Muslim countries and uh, stuff like that. And this is true if you look at Syria and uh, you know Iraq and stuff like that. Uh, you know uh, where you know Iraq was invaded by you know America, uh, just like the Prophet Muhammad prophesied that Muslim countries would be you know invaded with uh, tyrants and oppression and uh, you know in other places uh, you know. 
um, like like Palestine was also invaded by Jews and stuff like that, and Jews and the the Jews have been doing tyranny and oppression to Palestinians and stuff like that. So these are very specific prophecies that the Prophet Muhammad prophesized. And again, the prophecies the Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad gave hundreds of prophecies, which is too big to cover in you know one video or multiple videos. But again, I would just recommend this book, the smaller signs of the day, and uh, this book. Uh, the book of the end where um where these two where these two books talk about uh you know the prophecies of the prophet moment and stuff like that and give fulfillment of those prophecies so that's just some of the evidence uh for islam or this this is proof that the prophet moment was speaking out of supernatural he was supernaturally inspired by god because he was given these correct prophecies and stuff like that and the quran couldn't have been the work of a man or couldn't have been the work of a human because uh, the the quran gives scientifically correct statements which weren't found in pre-islamic sources which weren't found in the pre-islamic sources of the greeks or which weren't found in the books of the greeks the romans the egyptians the babylonians the iranians or the persians etc or the hindus or the indians or or the chinese or whatever so these are unique uh these are unique scientific accurate statements which weren't found in pre-islamic sources and these are unique prophecies of the quran in the proper moment which weren't found in pre-islamic sources of the romans the greeks the persians the uh the hindus uh the uh the, the persians uh you know the egyptians etc so these are unique uh, scientifically accurate statements and, and prophecies of the Quran and prophecies of Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, which weren't found in pre-Islamic sources and stuff like that. So there's no way that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, got um, lucky in, uh, or you know, he plagiarized or got lucky in, in guessing these things to come because um, you know these are very specific prophecies that could or could not have happened. Uh, in the future and all these prophecies did happen so you know it's not a coincidence and maybe one or two times it could be a coincidence but if it's happening over and over and over and over again if if you know many of the prior if, if you know dozens and dozens of prophecies of the proper moment uh, are coming true and if dozens of prophecies of the quran are coming true then that some supernatural source must have been involved it can't be written off as coincidence or lucky guesses or things like that so this is further proof that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, was inspired by Allah and the Quran was inspired by supernatural force. The Quran was inspired by Allah and stuff like that. Another argument um, I want to make is the argument from archaeological diggings. Uh, for uh, for example, the Quran mentions uh, in uh, the Quran chapter 89, verse uh, 7 through 9, that there's a city called Iram, and that city was um, found uh, later on. Uh, according to Splendor or an Unknown Empire by Howard uh, La Fay, on page uh, 730, uh, to 759 a national geographic uh, uh dated in december 1978 pages 735 to 736 says that an obscure city referred to in surah 89 of the quran which is iram uh, was found in an archaeological digging now you might be saying well you know so what the quran mentions a city that's later on found by archaeological by archaeological diggings uh, well the sodom and gomorrah was found in the old testament uh, you know does that mean the old testament is inspired by god or some supernatural force inspiring the um old testament and uh, that's not my argument my argument is how would the author of the quran how would proper moment peace be upon be so sure to include a city that may or may not exist in the quran so let's say the proper moment heard the story of iran from others and he put it in the quran so and later on archaeological 1400 14 1400 years later archaeological diggings never found the city of iran or you know iran has been proven to be to be false or it's been proven to be a, a fabled city and stuff like that so that that would have disproven the, that would have been further proof that probably one was making up the quran or the quran is uh the word of a man but that's that's not the case they found the city of Iram. They found the city of uh, of Iram. So how would the author of the Quran 
uh, how would Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him know to include the city of Iran, which may or may not exist? How would the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him be so sure to put a city uh, in the Quran, to put to mention a city in the Quran which may or may not exist? You know, so this was a this was a huge risk because the Prophet Muhammad, would, uh, if the Prophet Muhammad was really, you know copying off others or if he's just making up the Quran, how would he be so confident to include a city uh, that may or may not exist in the Quran? So that's my argument. So did did people know about the city of Iran before the Prophet Muhammad? Uh, it, it's possible, but it seems unlikely because, you know, um, uh, there's no pre-Islamic mention of the city uh, found in historical uh, historical sources that I know of. But even if even if they found references to Iran in uh, pre-Islamic sources, whether it's Gre Greco-Roman pre-Islamic sources or some inscription or something like that, that's that doesn't really uh, that's that doesn't really hurt the claim because or doesn't really refute the argument because my argument is how did how would how did the proper moment know to be be so sure to include a city the city of Iran into the Quran which may or may not exist you see so if the proper moment was just plagiarizing off other people how would he be so confident to include the right information when years later it could be proven false so how would the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him be so sure to include that city in the quran and then 14 1400 years later people found that city um so uh so even if the even if iran was mentioned in pre-islamic sources uh it doesn't hurt the claim that the quran is supernaturally inspired or the quran or uh, divine information was revealed in the quran that allah uh inspired the quran or some supernatural force or some divine uh being uh, uh revealed information in the quran because how would the author of the quran or how would the prophet Muhammad know to include that stuff in the Quran, how would he be so confident to include that stuff in the Quran? Uh, to include a correct a correct archaeological finding in the Quran. That's my argument. So even if there's pre-Islamic mentions of Iran, it doesn't refute the claim or doesn't hurt the argument. So is there a pre-Islam? Well, I I found one according to some you know anti-Islamic website where the author says that Ibn Ishaq mentions that uh, there was a, a mention of Ad in Iran. Uh, found in Ibn Ishaq page of 197 to 198. But again, Ibn Ishaq is not reliable. Uh, it's not a reliable source. It might be uh, early, but it's early, sure. Uh, I admit that, but it's not reliable. Uh, Ibn Ishaq has been condemned by great Islamic scholars such as Imam Malik and Imam Ahmed Ibn Humble for being careless in compiling his information. And if uh, and looking at the Isnad, it says Asim bin Omar bin Khattada told me on authority of some of the sheikhs of his tribe, uh, you know, that the Jews said, the Jews mentioned Ad and Iram, and the author of this article says that, yeah, that means that the Jews in Medina knew about Ad and Iram way before the Prophet Muhammad, or there is, or, and he, he concludes from this source that uh, Iram was known in Iran was known in Arabia before the Prophet Muhammad, or Iran was a pre-Islamic, um, was a pre-Islamic uh, uh, story or fable that Jews and Arabs knew about, um, and uh, but again, he's basing it on Ibn Ishaq, and Ibn Ishaq's not reliable, or the not in that story is not, or the chain of transmission in that story is not reliable. All it says is Asim bin Umar bin Qada. Katada uh, told me on authority of some sheikhs of his tribe, so it's not a it's not an authentic chain of transmission, or it's not an authentic it's not. So this story is not authentic according to Islamic standards. So you know, so much for so much for that pre-Islamic source of Iran. So you know, that's just some of the arguments uh, that I make for a positive case for the proper moment. Peace be upon him. That proper moment was. Um, uh, you know, uh, that problem one was truthful, that he really was, he really did have a pipeline to a supernatural force. He really had a pipeline to God and uh, that the Quran could not have been the work of man because the Quran is getting scientifically accurate statements right and is getting correct and it's predicting things that later on came true. So the Quran is making correct scientifically accurate statements and the Quran is making, um, you know, correct prophecies or the Quran is given correct prophecies.
that later on came true. So there's no way this is the work of man. Thus, a higher source must have been involved, and the higher source is God. Now, some might say, well, Satan inspired the Quran and stuff like that. But uh, according to uh, according to the Bible, uh, according to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says Satan cannot drive out Satan. So um, in the Quran says, seek refuge from Satan. In the Prophet Muhammad uh, also said, oh, we have uh, stories of the Prophet Muhammad doing exorcism on, on people, driving out demons, driving out devils from people and stuff like that. So the Quran says it's not the work of Satan. And the Quran says, seek refuge from Satan. Satan. So if the Quran is really inspired by Satan, why would the Quran say seek refuge from Satan? Or uh, uh, why would why would Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him be able to do exorcism on on uh, on people and stuff like that? So the Quran couldn't have been the Quran or the Prophet Muhammad could not have been influenced by Satan according to the New Testament because Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark, Satan cannot drive out Satan. So the Quran says it's from Allah, and the Quran says seek refuge from Satan over and over again in various Quranic passages. So there's no way the Quran is the work of Satan. So all this proves that uh, that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was inspired by Allah, and the Quran is the work of uh, the word of Allah. So this is further proof of the evidence for Islam. No other religion provides evidence for itself like Islam does. So I would just uh, you know recommend people to do their own research uh, on this, and you know they'll come to the same conclusion that I have that there's that Prophet Muhammad was indeed a prophet or Prophet Muhammad had a pipeline to some to a, a you know a divine to the divine being the divine creator and the divine creator is Allah and the Quran is not the work the word of man the Quran is the word of Allah or the Quran is the word of the creator the divine being the creator and divine being Allah the creator and divine being of uh, being Allah Almighty so this leads us to the conclusion that there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the final messenger of Allah. Thanks. Salam.